Welcome to The Less Stressed Life, all about making this your time to feel freaking awesome about your life, health, and happiness. This podcast of The Less Stressed Life is hosted by Krista Bigler. Krista is an integrative registered dietitian nutritionist who specializes in reducing food-related stress, inflammation, and symptoms of food sensitivities. She brings over a decade of nutrition expertise and playing with her food to the table. From coaching, teaching, writing, and working within a major food company to behind the scenes for a health celebrity. To learn more, visit lessstresslife.com. Hey there, this week's Kitchen Ninja tip was inspired by the conference I attended last week where the speaker was talking about culinary genomics and things that we can all do to kind of up level and hack our nutritional bi- like bio individuality. All of us can improve certain things and we'll do a whole series on it. But basically she was talking about the blue zones and the blue zones are areas of the world that scientists circled with blue pen. And this um, was brought to light by, I think it's Dan Butner. I know the last name is Butner, but he wrote a book about the common habits of centurions or people that are over 100. And so there was lots of um, common denominators, perhaps, but everything was a little bit different. But one thing that seemed to be common was a lot of these cultures had a sense of community and really embodied this less stress life. (laughs) So I hate to digress off of that. But I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the foods that can kind of up up upregulate some of the anti inflammatory processes that happen inside of our body. And I won't get all crazy intense, but there was a few different um, compounds. And one of them was lycopene. So if you weren't familiar with lycopene or if it's deep in the recesses of your brain, I think there was a lot of research that came out maybe 10 years ago. It was in the press a lot about lycopene. So lycopene is released when you cook down tomatoes. So there's a lot of great research out there about cooked tomatoes, which is fantastic for canned tomato producers. But since we're in tomato season, I was wondering what you do with all these tomatoes. I have been taking a little bit of a lazy route the last couple of years and just buying a big number 10 can for three or four dollars and making a bunch of salsa out of that. Although I do have a couple flats in my garage right now that my mom sent um, of these beautiful, amazing tomatoes. And I don't know about you. Maybe you're like, can I fast forward this part because I hate tomatoes? There's just nothing like a garden tomato. So curious what you do with them. I grew up on Mrs. Wages salsa, and so I've never been able to find anything that replicates it quite as much. So I still use Mrs. Wages salsa mix and her tomato sauce and her chili base, even for someone who doesn't like chili is very, very good. And it's great for someone who's really not sure about canning, or you could always cook it down, um, cool it, and then freeze it as well if you don't really want to can, but you're kind of curious about this thought or, you know, maybe you want to have some chili base or something like that. These are all great options and they don't require, you know, you to, for you to have a ton of ingredients on hand. Um, it's just the easy way to do some of this, um, what they call putting up at the end of the summer or, or prep or, you know, preserving your, preserving your goods. So I'm curious what you guys have. Why don't you drop me a line? Hello at lessstresslife.com. Today we've got Jade Simmons who talks to us about how we are meant for our own design life. We just have to unearth it. And it's just a great interview. So I look forward to your thoughts um, as well. Okay, today we have a special treat. Well, every week is a special treat here, right? For me especially because I get to have this little coffee chat with friends. And today we are having Jade Simmons, who is a, she's known as classical music's number one maverick. She's an acclaimed concert pianist and sought after powerhouse speaker. When she's not on stage, this one of a kind artist helps visionary women design a one of a kind life on purpose and back to back breakthrough. So I'm just so excited and curious and can't wait to hear her message today. Thanks and welcome, Jade. Thank you. And thank you for your curiosity and for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. So, you're a speaker and a musician, correct? That's right. That's so, right. Okay. So tell me about your day. What <laughs> What does that look like? Tell me about your job because I'm guessing we know what came first. Okay. So what came first, uh, chicken the egg, so to speak, would be piano. I started playing the piano when I was eight years old. And the only thing I ever wanted to do was be a classical concert pianist. And so all of my schooling, my bachelor's, my master's, all of my summers went towards learning and perfecting classical music and how to perform classical music. And I wanted 
what was a pretty rare career, which was to be a concert pianist. And so um, I headed down that path very seriously. And um, in the middle of my concerts, when I got out of grad school, I was programming these very competitive concerts. Um, I know you talk about being less stressed here, but I was living the very high stress life and I was playing the biggest pieces. And I think maybe also as an African-American female who didn't see herself replicated very often in classical music, I had some kind of inferior order thing going on there where I felt like I had to do more. Um, so I was playing these huge concerts that were tiring me out. And the only way I could get through them was by talking in between the pieces. And hence my speaking career was born. <laughs> That is really interesting. So tell me about how that pivot happened. Uh, give, give us a little bit of that story. Of course. So really what was happening was I just needed to catch my breath in between these huge pieces that I was programming. And I started telling stories to the audience about the music, about the composers, funny stories that I had learned about their personal lives. I would dare to tell them how I felt about the music and I would even go a step further and tell them how I thought they should feel or how I thought they should experience the music and lo and behold I'd get done with these concerts and I'd still be waiting to hear about how fabulously I played and how fast and furiously I played and they had the audacity to tell me about how much they love the stories and I remember being offended by that for like a year because I just wanted to impress these audiences. Classical music is a tough industry. I wanted to be impressive. And it took me a while to realize, oh my gosh, they're telling me they came for one thing, but they were impacted by something else. And in that moment, I remember shifting my goal from impressing the audience to impacting the audience. And you talk about alleviating stress. That changed the entire way that I felt on stage. And ironically, you would think it would have made me lose focus on the music, but my music got better because I was no longer worrying about missing notes. I was just worrying about missing a moment to have an impact on the audience. And so when that shift happened, my entire career trajectory changed in a great way. That makes me smile so much because I always try to think – and um, give kind of analogies for things. And so as I think about you talking about moving from impressing someone to impacting someone, I think about how we walk through our own lives all day long, and we get nervous about impressing people. And we get, you know, we have imposter syndrome, we always worried about some, you know, this happens a lot where you're worried about how someone else thinks. But if you would just shift it from worrying about impressing them to just impacting their life and being a light to their life, what kind of, I mean, could you imagine the stress that would come off all the time? Oh, man. The, the stress not only comes off, but there is a joy and a certainty of knowing that you are never in the wrong place at the wrong time. You are always in the right place. Even when you're not where you expect to be, if you are operating on purpose and you know that your purpose is not the thing that you do. I used to think my purpose was to play the piano, but then I realized my purpose was the thing that happened in other people whenever I did what it was that I was doing. So if people were getting joy or clarity or insight, people were telling me I'm hearing these stories and it's making me remember something I gave up that I should pick back up. That was my purpose in the moment in that concert. It wasn't to just impress them with Mozart. Uh, and so once you start operating that way, it doesn't just make you feel better um, in terms of less anxiety. It makes you feel purposeful, it makes you feel like you're on assignment, living life on assignment. It's like, where can I show up next and do the most good? <laughs> yeah, you're so optimistic about everything. I, it makes me, that really makes me smile. I just think about, um, you know, God doesn't make mistakes. And, you know, as you, anyone can look back at their life and say, well, that was an odd mix of events that brought me here. I used to think about this all the time, how I'd meet people and just think how it was one domino after the next, after the next. And I th really think like just nothing is on accident. Everything is preparing us for the next great opportunity of how we can make a difference in this world because what else are we doing here right yeah it's all about salt and light right you know if, if you're not adding to the mix it's like why just take up space in this arbitrary way and so there's there's kind of a quickening that happens when you realize 
that there's more to you than just impressing the people around you. But can you change the atmosphere of a room when you walk into it? So now with speaking, uh, what came out of that was uh, people started, uh, music presenters started booking me because I could talk. (laughs) Sounds very funny, but in classical music, people were used to the artist coming out, bowing, sitting down, playing the music, not saying anything. Then they would applaud and then everybody would go home. And there wasn't this um, interaction across the foot likes. And so I started getting booked. People would say, get that piano girl who talks, <laughs> you know, get mm-hmm. her to come in. Mm-hmm. And then I was adding value in a way because I could come in early and go and speak in schools. I could stay later and maybe give a seminar at a university. And this was coming from a gift of mine, speaking, communicating that I had laid down in the name of focus. And I think we sometimes wrongly think that focusing means becoming the smallest version of ourselves. I believe focusing means you take those multiple talents, that m- those multiple passions, and you focus them in one channel, and that channel is purpose. So the reason I can you know, write or do a webcast or coach and not feel like I'm being flaky or not committed to my talent is because I'm more committed to my purpose. And if my purpose is to activate people, I can say yes to whatever activity allows me to do just that. That's such an interesting, I mean, I think we can almost go back, just scroll back guys and replay that section right there. So that way you could rehear it again, because I hope that people are starting to think, you know, do you think about your purpose? Do we think about what we're meant for? Do we think about, and you're kind of talking about it as a verb. My purpose is a verb. You said, you know, I kind of an activator. That's right. That's right. Um, I like, there's a great mentor of mine who I remember when we were, she was doing an exercise on purpose and she said, fill in the blank. My purpose is to blank others. And it had to be a verb. And then uh, one thing I like to challenge people to do is don't just say others. Who are those others? And I know sometimes uh, your listeners might be thinking, well, you know, I'm not trying to be a professional speaker. I'm not out trying to change the world. I just want to live everyday life. Let me tell you what, there are still a group of others that you are assigned to. I really do believe that. And so uh, people who tell me they want to change the world, I'm always very curious as to what they're doing in the world in their close proximity. What's happening at home? Who's being changed by you at home? Which of your friends are, are, are experiencing more light because of you? And I think those are the true indicators, how we affect the people who are closest to us. What's that reaction that happens to your kids when you're around? That's usually a hint at how you're designed to operate out in the larger world as well. Good, good uh, lessons here to be learned for sure. So you went from classical music to speaking during classical music to just speaking sometimes? Does it always come together? I watched a TED Talk of yours, a TEDx, you're a TEDx speaker. <laughs> and I know you were mostly speaking and then all of a sudden you sat down and you played and I, it was, it. I don't know how to describe it, but it was very emotional playing of the piano. It was almost like, act, <laughs> I, it's not acting, but it's very, it's pretty incredible. So if you have a chance, go out and search for Jade on, on YouTube so you can watch her TEDx um, speech. But tell us a little bit about kind of how, what this has become for speaking. Sure. Is it always, is it always a, a mixture? Is it always a fusion? And, uh, and tell us a little bit about your experience with the TEDx um, stage. Sure. You know, TEDx provided a wonderful platform because they limit you to a certain amount of time. And what they're really saying, this is how I see it, is how much impact can you make in this short amount of time? Mm -hmm. 18 minutes for me is extremely short. My average lecture, speech, or keynote is 45 minutes to an hour. So 18 minutes was a big challenge for me. And I've done several of those now, and I love them because they have themes. And in the one that you saw, the theme was momentum, which is a favorite topic of mine. How do we unleash momentum? And I like to come from it from an unexpected perspective. And so my idea was that momentum comes from within. And that's because that's how it's happened in my career. I haven't had to go out and find a gimmick. I didn't say I'm gonna become the talking pianist. These were, this was the combination of going back and picking up parts of me that I'd laid down. So I like to tell people that they should look to bring all of themselves to every table all of the time. So I actually still perform classical. I still speak. And what you'll see often is what we call a musical keynote. 
So many corporations, non-music based, I'm talking, you know, uh, Nationwide or Hershey will bring me in to speak about creativity or record breaking or innovation. And the wonderful thing is they're bringing me in to speak on it as an expert because they've seen what has broken out for me in my particular industry. And they're saying, we don't care that you're not in our industry. We just want to know what is that fire? What is that formula? What is that innovation behind what you do that we can apply to what we do? And that's a wonderful, miraculous way to be used to know that if you decide to not limit yourself, other people see you as limitless. So you are helping to pour into others to inspire, to motivate, to bring change to the world and impact the world. But what impacts Jade? What pours into you so that you can pour into others? What do you do to, to keep your own fire lit, so to speak? If I'm being brutally honest, I was very bad at that for a long time. And uh, I was of the belief that if you were sleeping, you were losing. That if you were you know, I felt all of that was slacking. If you were taking breaks, you were slacking. And so uh, about 10 years ago, I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. And I remember having the symptoms of mono and one doctor wrongly diagnosed it as mono. And I said, look, if this is mono, we need to call Guinness because this is the longest (laughs) case of, of mono, I'm sure, in the world's history. But fast forward all these years later, I still have to deal with flare ups Um, of what I feel were the effects of overrunning my body, not giving my body a chance to recover. And so I've had to work very hard to learn the power of rest, the power of rejuvenation. One of the things that I teach high powered people especially is to live in seasons and that at least two of those seasons, one's going to be hibernation and one's going to be rest and they are different, but they will not look like the seasons where you're running around and doing your thing. And so I've learned uh, we're speaking right now from a hotel room that I have checked myself into only a few miles from home. I do that every couple of months so that I can get work done in an uninterrupted fashion but that I can also throw in a massage (laughs) if I want or take myself to dinner. So I work in retreats. Um, Exercise is extremely important to me, not only physically, but just for my psyche. Adrenaline is crucial to what I do, and I need the rush that comes uh, from the workout. And I'm not as happy or as nice of a person when I don't get my workout in, and I can admit that now. I think before, you know, as a mother, I have two kids and I have a wonderful husband who's my high school sweetheart. Who he, So he's seen me in every phase here, Krista. But um, I had to learn how to tell my family what I needed. You know, I had to learn how to tell them, hey, you know, this is a season where mommy needs to move a little quicker. She needs to have more uninterrupted time. But if you can help me with that in the next season, you'll get back super mom. You'll get back the mom that has time to roll on the floor with you without guilt, worrying that I should be doing something else. And that's taken practice, but it's a life now, uh, to answer your question, of living by seasons and working in rest and uh, allowing the people who love me the most to help me do the things that are important to me. There's a lot of key takeaways there. I was trying to write madly as I'm standing up here. Uh, So you had to learn how to tell your family what you need, which I think, you know, this boils down to communication, right? And we just have to continue to hone that and improve that. Um, Working in retreats, um, working in seasons. I love that you just let them know. I love everything you said about exercise and how it took you a while to admit that you weren't this friendly person without it. Um, But really what I hear from you is that you're giving yourself this grace Um, to have the seasons, to know what you need, to know when to slow down um, so that way you can recover. And this is an important lesson for anyone, right? These are, these are themes I hear when I talk to high performers. Um, Mm -hmm. If you don't embrace some rest, some giving back to yourself, you will burn out, you know, and you've experienced that already. And sometimes we have to hit that low point before we can come back up. How old are your kids? I have a nine-year-old boy and a four-year-old daughter. (laughs) Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's busy and fun. Yes, I know all about that. Excellent. So you now help people live what you call a designer life, an intentional life. Is that right? That's right. Uh, It's based on just the idea that, well, well, let me be, I I love being uh, surprisingly transparent. So 
I have worked as a coach now for uh, several years and I started out working, helping other entrepreneurs, usually women leave corporate careers and launch out on their own. Some people call that going from, you know, from corporate to calling kind of a thing. And so this funny thing was happening. I like speed. So we would work in these eight or nine week programs. We're going to help them kind of launch the beginning of their business. And I love messaging and wordplay. So we would work on titles and logos. And that's all I wanted to work on. And we would start working in the first four weeks. I noticed, wow, we're dealing with emotional stuff. We're dealing with spiritual stuff. We're dealing with personal stuff. We can't even deal with the professional stuff yet. And it used to be a frustrating thing to me because I thought they're paying me to help them launch their business, but I'm coaching them in all these other areas. When I sat back and looked at that happen over and over again, I realized, first of all, this was not an accident. They were coming to me because I was designed to work on all of these areas so that they could work together. So I call it 360 growth. So designer life is really a life that has balance in it. And it's called designer because it's the life, not that you're going to design, but the life that you were always designed to live. So what I was seeing in the coaching space, and you've probably seen this, is a lot of kind of gurus promising, if you just follow my template, if you just live out my life and you do exactly what I did, you're going to get my life, you're going to have my life and have everything I have. And I felt like, I don't know, like people were being cheated by that philosophy so I wanted to create something that said, I don't want to help you live my life. I want to help you unearth an original blueprint that was designed for you. I don't want you to wear my template. I want you to uncover your template so that you can have not my breakthrough, but you guessed it, the breakthrough that you were always designed to have. That's the designer life. And I think people are less stressed in it. They're more satisfied in it. And they're more at peace in that kind of a life. I love this. This is where we align completely, right? I hear you. You're a holistic coach in a way, right? Because you, you realize you had to address all the things. I found this same thing when I first started coaching. Um, and mm -hmm. I, you, you really wanted, I was just all about the results and I still just love the results, yeah. but it wasn't, health wasn't just about the numbers, the lab work. It wasn't just about the results. It was all these other pieces that were coming along for the ride. You know, people didn't, they they knew they wanted this thing, right? They wanted this material thing, but they had to address the emotional and spiritual and personal stuff like you just said. So I really resonated with that because sometimes, you know, it's like you have to have, it takes, as a coach, it can take a lot out of you to try to pour that into someone a little bit, right? And you have to be very strategic and methodical and it's so unique for each person. I, I can't say I'm an expert helping people in those areas because that's not my expertise my expertise is you know health and some mm -hmm. of this hard stuff um but i think it makes us much better professionals coaches um, mentors when we when we don't discount all the other stuff that has to come along for the ride it always has to be a piece you know in the process it has to be a piece and the process i decided needed to be more ongoing um, I've been in some fabulous coaching programs with amazing mentors, but then when they were over, it was like, you know, when you really think about the definition of coaching, sometimes it's temporary for a certain goal. Like you said, you want to help someone reach a certain health goal that they might have, but then the coach is gone or the program's over and that wonderful kind of bubble <laughs> that coaching creates is just burst. And so I wanted to create something where the person doesn't become dependent on the coach, but they become addicted to the lifestyle of growth. And so what if I could provide a space where visionary women who are on the move, who know they still have more ground to cover, can stay plugged in and now the growth applies to what, whatever season they're in. So if you're launching a business, the growth still applies. If you're building a family, the growth still applies. And you talk about, man, this really took a lot out of me just to plan it. But now that we've found the template, uh, we're excited because it's ongoing. Uh, women join and we're calling it a club. It's the Designer Growth Club because we wanted a space. You asked me the question, well, Jade, who's pouring into you? Where are you getting what you need? This is the space for all of those women who are out there pouring into everybody else. This is where they come to get poured into on a continuous basis. So we're very excited about what it's offering. We feel like we haven't seen anything quite like it, uh, especially in the coaching space. And we really believe it to be an ongoing 
Growth Development Club, where women can find other like-minded kindred spirits that they can connect to as well. I love this gap that you found. Um, I really, I really think it was a gap because the way you're talking is different or more innovative than most other coaches say. And what was very valuable, as you said, you know, I really want you to unearth the original blueprint that you were always meant to meant to live. And that's incredible, because I don't think I've never heard anyone else say that, say it like that, in fact. Um, So I just, I love what you're saying here. And I'm I'm listening. And I'm thinking. Oh, I probably need the Designer Growth Club. I'm sure I do. Right? You know, I need this. Uh, I need this because I didn't know that this was a gap in my life. But as I hear you yeah. talk about it, I resonate with everything you're saying completely. So, tell me more about how. Um, so it probably took a lot of renditions to kind of come up with this template, this blueprint. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay. The big takeaway for me was this is the lesson. You know, we all have a lesson that. God's going to keep throwing back at us until we get it, right? And so my recurring lesson is to learn how to surrender the outcome. Um, Those of us who are hard workers and big visionaries, we plan, 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 and we have a very definitive, specific way how we think something's going to look. And so I'm learning over and over, and I teach over and over to surrender the outcome, put all your energy and focus into the work at hand and into the positioning and into the preparation and believe that the intended outcome will be that's what happened with Designer Growth Club. I planned to launch it in January of 2017. I had it all mapped out. I knew what it was going to look like. It started out looking more like a subscription box. And I had all ready to go. January came and I didn't feel it. It just didn't feel right. I couldn't press the button. So I kept working. I decided it was going to be out in March. Long story short, three different deadlines later, it then morphed into something that was more all-inclusive, Uh, The community aspect wasn't in it originally uh, because personally for me, it was not the aspect that I looked for. I think we have to be careful as coaches not to design programs based on what we want, what we think people need. So we actually put together a focus group and I just simply asked visionary women, what do you need? I was so shocked by their answers, Krista. I thought they were going to say we need tons of content because I love tons of content. I thought they were going to say, we just want to be plugged in uh, to the content. Leave us alone. We'll learn it on our own time. They said, we need community. I need a different inner circle. I need people who think bigger than me. I need something that doesn't end. I need something that I can trust is going to be there. And I remember sitting in that focus group and tearing up because I said, God, this is not what I originally signed up for. Um, And I know you probably had that moment where, you realize this thing you're giving birth to doesn't look like the baby you thought you signed up for. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> kidding. Um, but when the baby was birthed, there was, I realized what I thought was fear was a reverence of this new responsibility. It was, I was being told, you're heading into a new phase of existence, and this is what is required, and these are the people who are going to be linked to you. And this is what you're responsible for. And you're going to love every minute of it. It's going to be hard work, but it's going to be worth it. And so here we are today, almost 10 months, uh, you know, behind schedule, so to speak, but exactly right on time. Yeah, I'm glad you told us about the focus group and kind of that metamorphosis that had to come from asking people because, well, a couple of reasons. Um, first, I was going to ask, did you have to postpone it? Because I know you said you didn't feel it, but was there ever imposter syndrome and other things? But when you said focus group, I think we all have to stop and ask ourselves, what do we need? Because do we even yeah. ask that question? I think I kept saying, what do I want to give? <laughs> I remember leading with, okay, here's what I'm going to offer. This is what I'm going to do. And people are going to have to just, maybe they want it or they don't. And I understand needing to set those boundaries, but if I'm really honest about wanting to be in the center of my purpose, serving the people I'm designed to serve, I need to find out what those people say they need. And then I need to say, how am I designed to give them what they're asking for? Um, I will also say there were things that in the focus group they said that they wanted that I did not include. Because when I look back at my experience with working uh, with women like them, I knew this is what they think 
they want. I know it's what they're going to write down they want, but once we start working, this is what's actually going to evolve. You know, so you have to make those choices based on your experience. You're going to have to trust your gut. Um, but there were delays, and I love to teach that there's man-made delay and there's divine delay. We know man-made delay, right? Procrastination, hesitation, doubt. But divine delay only happens for two reasons. It's one, because you're not ready to offer what you are designed to offer. So God's like, I'm not going to mess up this thing on you. We're going to get you ready first. Or the second type of divine delay is the world's not ready yet. And so sometimes you'll have a book idea and for whatever reason, you can't get it out. But boy, when you finally write it, it's like the world was waiting on it in that exact moment. Had you put it out six months earlier, it would have come out the crickets, you know, but in this particular season, the world needed to hear exactly what you had to say. So I feel like uh, DGC has been birthed now at a time where uh, women, you mentioned yourself, Krista, a lot of the women who are signing up are coaches because they are the ones most likely to be giving out all the time and needing to refuel. So we believe it's a season where there has been a gap in the marketplace and people who have tried other things but now know exactly what the missing piece has been will look at this and go, oh my gosh, there's my missing piece. I love this. I sorry, I'm over here like uh, uh, <laughs> having one of those moments. I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. So, if you had to have like a gut reaction for the person listening to this, um, that feels like you're speaking right to him or to her, um, what do you want to tell that person? Um, this is your ideal person that says, "Oh, I think she's speaking directly to me," and I didn't even know this was a gap for me. What would you say to that person? You have more power than you think to bring about and accelerate the breakthroughs that you've been waiting on. I think we a lot of times have bought into this concept that the only thing we can do is play the cards we've been dealt or just kind of deal, uh, sit back helplessly and have to just live with whatever life does to us. And so what I would love for your listeners to remember is that life is not doing anything to you. And nothing is happening to you. It is all happening for you. I know that's been said before, but the way that I like to teach that is that when you can recognize, when you can have something happen and say, what is happening for me in this? Why is it happening for me right now? What is it getting me ready for? And how do I need to prepare? Uh, if you know that, that those things are within your power, man, not only will you lose stress, you will gain such a sense of urgency and a certainty in knowing that you are here on this earth to be alive for such a time as this. And I think that's a miraculous thing to be aware of. Those are amazing questions to be asking ourselves. And if nothing else, they'd make an incredible repeat journal prompt again and again and again. <laughs> so tell us, Jade, where can we find and connect with you? And uh, I think you told me the Designer Life Club. It's DLC, right? DGC, Designer Growth Club. Designer and, Growth and Club. That's right. That's right. And you can go to designergrowthclub.com. We just opened the, the doors last Sunday and we are receiving our inaugural charter members. But the doors are going to close very soon. We get underway October 1st. So registration ends on September 30th. And as per, speaking of taking what people have asked us to do, we added an incredible new payment plan so that people could really sign up and be in it for the long haul. So if they go to designergrowthclub.com, they'll learn about our four different ways that we teach you to grow, all the upgrades you can add to your growth if you're working on a business, developing your faith, or developing your voice. If you want to go on a wonderful retreat, escapes, we built in so many ways to grow. So I'm looking forward to connecting to visionary women over there. Oh, fun. So you definitely allowed them to come up, say, you know, this is my this is my uh, priority or my my focus right now. Pick your focus. You can't prioritize. I think what we are trying to get women to understand is, like you said, it's this is a process that's 360. We want you to come full circle. But if you have things that you want to focus on in whatever season you're in, there's growth built in for you. So we love that the base level of growth can be applied no matter what season you're in, no matter what you're working on. But that if you're a growthaholic, which pretty much all of the women who are signing up are, you have many ways to upgrade and tweak and focus in the direction that you want to. 
Love it. And let's say someone catches this after it closes and they feel crushed. Uh, is there a kind of a timeline to when they could expect to see it again? Or how does that work? We are really urging if if it even remotely feels like something you want to do, sign up now, do the first quarter of growth. You renew the subscription every quarter. And the reason we're saying that is because we have not set a date, Krista, for when we're going to open the doors again. We want to take our time and marinate with these first charter members uh, before we open the doors again. So sometime in 2018, we will reopen them. But, you know, you saw what happened the first time. It could be next October. Right. So. Mm-hmm. This is the time to join. And because of the way we've structured payment, there's really not a lot of risk involved. So if you feel like this is what you need, this is the time to do it. And the rates that we're offering now will never be this low again. So as a charter member, you get in now and you want to get in while the getting is good. And we think that is N-O-W. Yeah, great. So if someone listens to this podcast after this week, we're sorry, but I'm sure there's a place where you can sign up for the wait list at minimum That's at, right. at um, D G see designer Designer growth Growth club yep all right so that's the best place for people to find you in general are there other places that they can follow you online they can also find me my website's jadesimmons.com and the party's on instagram at official jade simmons i'm over there a lot as well as on facebook at jade media so i'm looking forward to connecting to your listeners great well thank you so much for sharing just this amazing i don't even know how to i'm gonna have to like debrief after this and consider you know (laughs) What did all of this mean? Because there was just a lot of knowledge here and just things that we don't always think about. Um, and I, I resonated with so much of, of what you said here. So thank you for coming and sharing, um, you know, what continuous growth looks like and what a designer life looks like and how we're, we're made for that already. And we just have to um, unearth it pretty much. So thank you so much, yeah. Jade. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you for what you do. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're so kind. Thanks. She's just a very authentically gracious and kind and thankful person. I'm, it's just very nice when people thank you for your time. So she said something that I wanted to mention really quick, and that is, what do you guys need? I would love to, for you if you could just let me know. Hello at lessstresslife.com. I know it's easy to ignore that because you're in the car, you're driving, you're multitasking. But if you can just remember to reach out to me, let me know what you need, then I can help with that. I hope. Anyway, have a great week and I'll talk soon. 